semantic kernels office hours. We're looking forward to diving into your questions. We have a couple of announcements from our end. So diving right in, we have our weekly cadence. So this is our weekly office hours for semantic kernel for US and EMEA. And that's every week from 8 to 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then we also have a monthly APAC office hours. That's also for those, the APAC time zone. So if you have colleagues or others who are looking to join, we have that on the second Wednesday of every month from 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific Time. And so just wanted to give everyone a quick reminder of that. I want to highlight a couple of releases that we've had since we met last. In .NET, we now have 1.26.0 out. And so this has some fixes for Dapper runtime, parallel function calling, some other updates as well. We also mentioned last week uh, adds in the Amazon's AWS Bedrock connector, and there's a great blog post on that. And so if you haven't had a chance to look through this release, there's a lot of great goodness here. And then moving over to Python, we also have 1.13.0 out. And so this includes some new features within Python for the old llama uh, tool call and the image content as well that Tao has been working on. And then it also has some enhancement and fixes that uh, Evan has been working on for allowing a caller to specify the file uh, IDs that already exist when creating assistance and other items there as well. And so if you haven't had a chance to look at the most recent Python release, we recommend you take a minute to do that. I'll post the link to the releases and others in chat of a couple other links I'll go through as well. And then moving on to our documentation, we'll cover a couple of docs updates as well in our updates, but we have some updates for NoSQL connectors within our filters and then uh, vector store general documentation. And we just recently added our uh, pieces for Java within APIs as well for our documentation there. So if you haven't had a chance to take a look, uh, there's a lot of great updates there as well. And then diving into backlog by bucket, as always, I know folks are looking to see what we're working on the prioritization. And so I've linked to that in check. If you are interested to learn what we're working on, we're getting a lot of things wrapped up for Ignite. And so you should see a lot of announcements uh, around the nap night time as well. And then moving on to our blogs before we go through a couple of our uh, top items to cover, there's a number of new blogs that we've had out. I've linked as well in chat to our blog page, but we have a blog in Korean. There's a monthly series that uh, Team Korea has been producing. And so we'd love to be able to share this with colleagues around the world as we have it both in Korean and English. And then there's a great update around what we'll be sharing out at Ignite from Evan as well of Productive AI. And so if you haven't had a chance to take a look, we recommend doing that. As I'd mentioned that we had chatted about in last office hours, but we do have AWS Bedrock for Semantic Kernel and .NET and Python. And so being able to have this connector out is a great way to see that Semantic Kernel is across so many different platforms within their connectors. And then we'll cover today our chat history update. And so I'll turn that over to Mark, but just want to also call out before we dive in that there is a Java 1.4.0 that has been released as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over first to Dimitro to cover graduating filters. Dimitro, over to you. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let me show my screen real quick. Um, <clears throat> and please let me know if you can see it. Perfect. I can see it now. Can others see it as well? Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, we have uh, this pull request to move obsolete um, filter classes. So this is just a small notification that we are going to do that uh, probably um, during our next release, which is going to happen next week. Um, so um, in our code base, there were uh, experimental classes like function uh, filter context, function invoked context, function invoking context, and similar uh, classes uh, for prompt filters so um we are going to remove them from our code base uh, since those classes were experimental and uh, you know in the latest versions of um our package uh .net, specifically the net version of our package uh they were not used um so the good news uh, uh is that basically uh this is not going to impact you in case you are uh using latest version of semantic kernel but for example if you are using uh one of the older versions of semantic kernel, uh, like 1.10, for example, um, or 1.9, which uh, 
basically contains uh, all of the uh, previous uh, filter classes and you're looking to upgrade to the uh, newest version of semantic kernel, uh, this is going to impact you because uh, those classes, they won't exist um, anymore. And in case if you are looking um, for more information about a uh, new version of filters and new classes, uh, for example, there's information, we have a specific uh, dedicated uh, blog post with this information. Uh, here you will find like uh, how our filters uh, changed and uh, you know what uh, which new classes were introduced for that functionality um, examples for each filters and so on and you can also find more examples in our repository so i'm going to check um uh, then uh, that link in the chat and in case you have um you know, you know any issues with migrations or any other issues just uh, feel free to let us know uh in github discussions or under github uh, issues in our repository um that's me thank you Perfect. Thanks so much, Dimitro. Any questions folks may have, as Dimitro mentioned, please feel free to reach out in GitHub discussions. We go through and triage those on a daily basis as well. But if there aren't any questions, we can go through and uh, leave time for Q&A as well. I'm going to turn it over to Mark to cover our chat history updates. Mark, over to you. OK, um, thanks, Sophia. Um, so hopefully you should be seeing my screen now. Um, so yeah, so in the slides, um, I've pasted a link to the, uh, we've got a blog post um, describing kind of like you know, what I'm going to um, show you today. And um, there's also a link to the the sample that I'm going to show. Um, so we've had a number of questions from people about how to kind of like manage the size of chat history. And to start with, we've put together a number of examples um, that show basically different strategies to do that. Uh, eventually, what we want to do is um, work together with the the .NET team and actually build this in um, either into semantic kernel or into Microsoft extensions .AI as kind of middleware for for managing chat history. But um, let me take you through a scenario just to kind of um, explain what the the problem that people are kind of running into. Right. So in this case, I've got a, uh, a very I'm simulating kind of like a user chat. And um, in this case, my I want the model to behave like a librarian and give me information about uh, books on different cities. And I'm going to ask it about a number of different cities, including Seattle, Dublin, Amsterdam, et cetera. Now, when I run this, um, it's basically the naive or straightforward implementation would be to just keep build, adding into the chat history, right? So add each user message, add each response, and then loop through until, until we're done. And um, when you do this, like the results are very good in terms of the responses you get. Um, and then the number of tokens, like for this particular example, the number of tokens is somewhere between, you know, eight and 9,000 tokens get used. But um, if you look a little bit more closely at the user asks, you can see that these are all independent, right? So I don't need to include earlier user questions and earlier um, responses from the model to get a good answer, right? Like, so I don't need to know about Seattle to get a good answer about London. But I, I, it is important that I include the, the system prompt. So um, the first strategy and the most straightforward strategy to use is to just truncate based on um, the number of messages, right? So I, what I want to do is I want to include um, the last N messages in the in the conversation, right? Um, so in this case, I'm going to say I'm going to truncate to a size of two. And what that's going to do is it's going to maintain the system message, which is very important to maintain. And also the last user message will, will get included. And um, when we run um, this particular sample, um, we get equally good um, results. And um, actually, I have the, um, the responses here. But you can see that the number of tokens used drops significantly, right? So it's down around um, from, you know, eight, 9,000 down to about 3,000 tokens. Uh, and, you know, this is for, this is a very easy strategy to implement. And um, we have uh, a pattern that we are suggesting people use where you, we're basically just providing a decorator around the chat um, completion service, and we're providing the uh, reducer implementation. So this is a truncating um, chat history reducer. Um, so, but but there are problems here, right? If I'm the only context I'm getting is the last n messages that I'm using, right? 
So if we think about a slightly um, slightly different scenario, okay. So in, in this case, the the system messages um, to the model is that we're you're an expert in the best restaurants in the world, right? And um, these are the user um, questions, right? So I'm going to ask for restaurants in Seattle. Then I'm going to ask for the best Italian restaurant. And what the user means is they want the best Italian restaurant in Seattle, um, you know, the best Korean. And then they're going to switch to Dublin and they want the best Indian, the best Japanese. Um, so if we look at the the results from running this, in, in this case, the, the chat history reducer we're going to use is going to um, use the max tokens, right? So we're going to count the number of tokens and um, that's the um, that that's how we're going to truncate. Okay, so as soon as the number of tokens gets exceeded, we're going to start um, truncating the chat history. Um, now, if I look at the responses here, you can see I asked for restaurants in Seattle, gives me some, some suggestions. When I ask for the best Italian restaurant, I'm getting um, Spinazzi, um, which is a, a restaurant in, in Seattle, and then Jewel is, is another, is a Korean um, restaurant. Then I'm asking about Dublin, um, and I'm getting an Indian restaurant in um, Glastool in Dublin, and then a Japanese restaurant um, all in Dublin. So this all seems to work really well. The, the, the only, normally actually, um, one of these may not work right, like typically the last one may not work right, because we, um, you know, we just run out of, um, or some con the context gets um, truncated. Um, the reason this one, this particular one works is that in the system prompt, I've said, keep the responses short, right? So um, my, you know, 100 um, token um, count limit works really well because I'm getting um, nice um, short responses. And you can see my like my total um, token count is 932, right? Um, now, the, the last strategy that's included here is a summarization strategy, right? So we're using it, the same set of examples here, right? Where it's um, restaurants. Um, this case, I'm not going to ask the model to keep um, to keep everything short, um, and I'm asking for you know again um, Seattle and Dublin. But um, this this reducer, what it's going to do is, um, when the number of messages reaches four, it's going to start um, truncating or it's going to start summarizing the messages. It's going to send a summary of the older messages plus the two most recent messages, which will be the system message and the last user ask. And that's what it's going to send to the to the model to get, um, to get um, responses. Um, so when we look at the output here, you can see that we're asking for restaurants in Seattle. We're getting a, a nice, long, detailed um, response. The best Italian restaurant, we're getting it for from Seattle. The best Korean, um, again, is Seattle. So we switch over to, or actually Brazilian as well. So that's working. Then we switch over to, to Dublin. We get a long list of um, restaurants. Um, and then we start to kind of get good responses about Dublin as well, right? Because the summary is working. Now, in this particular case, this one normally works pretty well. In this case, by the time I get to the French restaurant, it's confused, it's lost context. And it's asking me for the um, the city um, for, for the information. So um, yeah, so so the, these are some example strategies that you can use to to manage chat history. There is a certain amount of kind of tweaking that's required de depending on your application and the type of questions people are going to be um, asking, and also kind of like the you know what kind of like you know um, what kind of like token count usage you want to see, right? So you can see here when I went up to summarization, my token um, count usage went up again. It went up around 2000, but it's still much better. So I'm still getting good results and it's an awful lot better than um, like the initial um, 8000 or 8 to 9000 that I was seeing at the beginning. OK, so I'll just pause there and see are there any um, any questions? Yeah, thanks so much Mark, for going through the demo. I'm seeing a couple in chat. The first one, is there a similar uh, decorator for Python? Um, we do, we don't have the Python samples yet, but um, yeah, that's something that we're um, we're going to work on. Like you know, so we'll do the equivalent um, samples for Python then as well. Perfect. And then Jose, I saw your question as well. Do you want to come off of mute?
Oh, you got me off. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mark, that looks like a very significant speed up and token reduction, so cost reduction mostly. Uh, but in in speed, uh, did you measure the improvement in speed? I mean, if there are less tokens to produce, I guess that uh, the processing of the large language models should be faster, right? Um, yes, yeah. Um, actually, I haven't measured this, like you know, and I do have an example here. Um, that uses streaming, right? So um, with you know, streaming is going to be kind of like you know um, less sensitive because you're you're giving the users feedback straight away as soon as um, part of the response starts to come back. Um, but yeah, actually, no, that's a that's a good question. I'll I'll take a look. I'm not sure if I'll have time before ignite, but I'll take a look at actually adding in some performance metrics. So we actually include a a measure of the um, time to getting your first token back, which seems to be the the measure a lot of people want to use in terms of responsiveness, you know, but but yeah, that's a good suggestion. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks so much, Jose. And I'm just seeing one other item in chat from uh, uh, Ramos. Is there anything else that you wanted to come off? I mean, I saw you had uh, the way that you could be able to remove all open AI tool calls from history. Is there anything else you wanted to add or any other questions that you may have? Uh, it was up uh, in two weeks, uh, two weeks ago, about uh, removing tools calls from via the reducer. But it seems the new ones can't do that yet. So I just ended up making an, uh, it one myself. It's, it's pretty easy to get rid of them. So we don't need the result of a tools call uh, clogging up the history. But, uh, yeah, yeah, and, and I've included that actually in the samples that, um, that I provided. Right, so. In the blog post, I've just talked a little bit of when you're removing tool calls, um, you need to be make sure make sure that you remove everything kind of like cleanly. Like you don't want to end up with a tool call response um, and not a no initial request because that'll be a bad request to the to the LLM, right? So there's some example code that shows how to um, some of the considerations you need to um, take account of when you're doing that. But then, yeah, that's included in the samples then as well as well. Cool. Perfect. Thanks for the question. See one more as well from Brett. Is there an interface available that would allow us to implement uh, custom chat history reducers? Um, yeah, so I've provided a sample interface that you can use. Um, so there's a few framework type um, classes that show um, this. There is an abstraction for a chat history reducer. There's three, three different implementations. And then there's a, a class that allows you to decorate any chat completion service with a with a reducer so it's all provided a sample code to start with but we do want to look at moving this into into semantic kernel at some point in the future perfect thanks mark and i put the link to that as well in chat above brett if you uh, need to grab that for the uh, chat history reducer sample as well any other questions folks want to come off mute with would love to hear from you if you do Great, I'm seeing a good question chat. Uh, let's see, Amal, would you mind coming off of mute? Sure, um, so this question is uh, specific to a custom plugin we developed. So uh, this plugin actually, the work of that plugin is to get the data from a different system. So, but when we try to do any search or any put any, com and the, any prompt, it's actually going and uh, doing the search from the LLM instead of calling our custom plugin. Or a custom function, right? So, how can I enforce to call our custom plugin instead of going to the LLM and getting the results? Um, um, okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. go ahead. Okay. Uh, one second. Um, so, the function choose behavior functionality we have that allow you to call functions uh, has three behaviors. There is like auto behavior, there is required behavior, and there is a known. I believe you're using auto, right? Because auto yeah, kind right. of like uh, instruct LLM just to decide itself okay. whether to call a function or just reason about your prompt without calling a function. Did you try to use the required uh, function choice behavior? Because that's behavior that intentionally introduced in order to force model to call your function. Okay, so instead of auto, we to try using required. Yes, right. 
Okay, and uh, that that will force everything to call this particular custom plugin, right? Um, and uh, if even yes. if I have other plugins, it will not even go to other plugins also if there is a matching function description comes. So the way it works is just it's very similar to auto. So all mm -hmm. the functions you've imported into the kernel will be advertised. So model mm -hmm. will be aware of all those functions, right? And it will be up to the model to decide which function to call, but it it must it it will have to call the function. So it it, okay. it can't just go and just decide not to call it because you explicitly said that the uh, this is a required choice. Yeah, we'll try that out. Uh, thanks, thanks for the input. Uh, just a follow up question: If uh, instead of English, if I want to search with a different language, is there any way to implement it? Uh, because currently it is doing a matching with the English text I have provided inside the function description, right? Will it automatically work with a different language other than English? Oh, you mean just when the language for the prompt and the plugin descriptions are yeah. different? If that's your case. Yeah. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, well, it, most likely it will depend on the uh, of the capabilities of the LLM you're using. So if the if LLM can handle different languages, then I believe it's possible. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you for the question. Thanks. I see in chat we have a really good one from uh, Ramos. We're going to get to that right after our last update. And actually, Sergey, over to you for our updates on function calling before we get into open Q&A. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so uh, for the last two weeks, we've released uh, two updates to the function calling options. First update, we've introduced two properties. One property is allow parallel call. Uh, that property allow, basically controls how LLM are uh, calling a function or many functions. For example, there are cases when uh, LLM need to call two functions. And instead of doing it sequentially, uh, using this flag, setting this flag, first flag, allow parallel calls, allow LLM to call them in parallel, which means that LLM will uh, respond to semantic kernel and say, hey, semantic kernel, I have these two functions I want you to call. So uh, as in opposite to LLM telling a uh, semantic kernel to call the first function, then semantic kernel uh, invoke the first function, send result, put the result back to the chat history, send the request to LLM, and then the LLM uh, declaring, say, I would like semantic kernel to call the second function, right? So when you set the flag to true, uh, if LLM uh, see the need to call two functions at the same time or in parallel, it will do that. So that will allow you to say one extra uh, round trip to the um, LLM service, uh, which may reduce the overall speed of your operation, plus it will reduce number of, of, of the overall tokens sent back and forth uh, during your operation. And the second flag we introduce is the allow concurrent invocation. So this flag is controlled the way semantic kernel invoked the function. Before this flag was introduced, all the functions uh, requested by LLM were executed sequentially, one after another. But uh, we recognize the need for a parallel invocation and we've added this flag, which allows now the parallel invocation. So when LLM returning the list of the functions for invocation, semantic kernel recognize this and see that this flag is set to true and invoke those functions in parallel. Again, so it allows you uh, to uh, fast execute the functions because the more functions you have, the faster you get the result of if you're executing or invoking those functions uh, in parallel. And here you can see basically example how you can uh, configure those two options. On the line 17, you see that, well, if you want uh, to tell the model to call parallel functions, you need to set the slug to true. And the same in line 18, you can see that, well, in order to activate the concurrent invocation, we need again to set that property to true. And then you need to pass this option to the, as you see in the line 21, and there is this uh, function choice behavior auto where you need to provide that option. And those options are applicable to required function choice behavior as well. 
So that's me. Um, Perfect. Please let us know if you have questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Larry. I'm seeing some questions for other topics, um, but I am seeing uh, one around. Uh, I think the, the individual was just wanting clarity of the difference between parallel and uh, concurrent. And can you uh, talk about the difference between those two? So concurrent mean is just like, well, basically, <laughs> um, so depending on the number of CPUs you have uh, on your machine, right? So if you have one CPU, all the processes on your machine are going to run uh, sequentially, even so you have the solution of like a parallel or concurrent invocation. Basically, when you have two apps open on your Windows machine, those apps are not working uh, in parallel. They are executed sequentially and like Windows separation system or Linux separation system basically hiding that sequential nature of execution from us, right? And we have the solution of, of parallel execution. So concurrent mean is basically the uh, functions run concurrently uh, 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 by, by semantic kernel. So they're not, it's it's kind of like a opposite of sequential. So, and yeah, that's that would be my best explanation of it. Perfect, thanks so much, really appreciate that. I'm not seeing any other questions specifically on function calling, but if folks do have them, feel free to come off of mute. We'd love to hear from you. If not, we'll dive into um, open Q&A and there's a couple in chat I wanna come back to. Uh, Ramos, do you mind coming off of mute? We'd love to hear from you and your question to dive into it. Yeah, um, it's about uh, some best practices around the plugins and prompt engineering for them. Uh, so you have some guidelines already that are linked in chat uh, that as an example, talk about snake case for uh, for the description of the the kernel function and so on. But uh, there is some things left out in that. For example, the input parameters, which is uh, C sharp uh, naming normally, should we also go snake case on that and and go against normal rules because we can't put uh, JSON properties on them? Is it best to put the descriptions on the parameter level on the function level in general i guess you have done a lot of these uh, over the years and and if it's possible to give any best practices uh, to to get the best result of uh, being able to call the, the functions correctly yeah that's a really good question i'll turn it over to sergey to dive in um so what i would say well we, we have documentation uh created a while ago and i saw that there are like a, a few best practices mentioned there one of them is um for example today you can uh, provide a description for a function uh, right but the advice is don't do that unless it's necessary because llm is capable enough to um to infer the uh, function purpose from its name. So if you could just name your function in the short and concise way so that it's clear what that function about, for example, if you are accessing list of the users, just like name it like get users or get list of the users, right? Instead of just, uh, I don't know, just giving some ambiguous name so that LLM can't reason about. And in this case, if you have just function name are small and crispy. So it should be enough for LLM just to recognize that, oh, well, I am asked to reason about users and here the function that give me a list of the users. And LLM is, will be capable enough just to understand to call that function, right? So in this case, you don't need to provide a description for this function. And every time you provide a description, this description is sent to LLM and again, so it's basically eating, eating your tokens every time you send a long description. And again, so you need to play with this. Uh, uh, and again, it, it's it's also hugely depend on the model because some models may reason about this short function name, some model may not need. So I think it's just like a trial and error approach. The same with parameters. So if you could just, instead of naming your parameters like P1, P2, P3, P9, right? So if you could give the parameters meaningful names, again, so it will increase the chances of LLM to reason about your parameters. And as a result, you will have just right values for your parameters when LLM decide to call your function. Um, what else? Um, yeah, and of course, like if you have more 
uh, granular functions like smaller functions with a smaller number of parameters rather than one big function with many parameters, it will be uh, better uh, from the from an LM point of view because like it it will it will reduce the hallucination uh, and the, it will increase the chances that the model will select the uh, function that you um, uh, you wanted to select for invocation. That's yeah. that's the best guidelines I can give you at the moment. Yeah, and regarding parameters, uh, let's say I have a parameter that is an ID. Uh, mm -hmm. I often see it uh, using the name of that uh, related object instead of the ID. Um, and then I was uh, uh, recommended to instead use a, a complex type. Uh, but whenever you do a complex type as a, a parameter, uh, it seems like the LLM takes much longer to respond. Is that a normal use case that uh, whenever you end up with uh, more advanced uh, things uh, for parameters? And you're saying it's slower or taking more time? Are we talking about yeah, like like milliseconds like or minutes? Or we, we, are, we are snacking like from one second to five seconds or something like that. Mm. Uh, personally, I just I haven't seen that. And like I haven't heard about that, but well, definitely if you're saying that's that's most likely the case. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it would be good to look at the case and understand where the problem is. Is it just LLM taking like five seconds to craft the JSON for that complex object, or is it something on the kernel semantic kernel side that like we are trying to, for example, decentralize that JSON into the uh, target uh, parameter type so it would be good if you could just provide a sample and like yeah and then we can start from there and look at look at it and understand what's what's yeah. what's going on can we in any way measure ourselves using the source code uh, well there are open source profilers so you can try to run um run uh in work invoke a sync uh, method and in that profiler and comparing the um, invocation of the uh, function with a complex parameter type and invocation of the function with a simple parameter type. And of course, you will need probably to uh, deduct the, um, the, the time for the request. Uh, mm -hmm. for, this, for this purpose, you will have to probably register the uh, custom HTTP handler so that you that the handler that the place where you put the code which would measure the request time so answering your question yes it's possible so it's right. not yeah cool thank you great thanks so much for the question and then sherry while we have you there's one more in chat around function calling from han it's very useful information he appreciates that and you had a question on is there a way that you can set a priority of which function to call first um, I think that the question belonged to the prompt engineering realm. Um, I haven't seen any properties from LLM, neither from Azure OpenAI, OpenAI again. So I'm saying I haven't seen, so it doesn't mean that there are no properties. If you're aware of any of that property that allow you to say that like, LLM, if you have 10 functions in your disposal, make sure that the the second one is called first or like that function called first. But at the moment, I have not aware of this property. And I believe it's the only possible way to do that is via the prompt engineering. Basically, you will uh, direct LLM and say, hey, LLM, here are the list of the functions. And like, if you're about to call this function, make sure that call it first, something like that. But apart from that, I'm not aware of any solution of any alternative solution you can use in order to decide on the priority of the function calling. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Sergey. Han was saying thanks in the and, chat as well. And if you if you discover that way, please let us know. So we will try to model it and introduce it in our instruction. Yep, sure Absolutely. will do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then Jose, so in chat you had some questions. Do you want to come off of mute?
If not, we can come back to them. Other questions folks may have, feel free to raise a hand or come off of mute. We'd love to hear from you. I'm just looking through chat. I'm not seeing anything else come in, but would love to hear from you. So feel free to come off of mute or type your question as well. Oh, there's a great one in chat. Um, Robert, just reading through. Robert, would you mind coming off of mute to share? Yeah, so I'm working with Azure OpenAI. And we're looking to use the content filtering, the annotations that are provided to us when a message is blocked. And we've been noticing with Semantic Kernel that you guys aren't really exposing any of that information very well. So when a message is uh, on input blocked, they're supposed to be in the exception uh, inside, I believe, in an inner exception. It's supposed to include the, uh, the specific uh, annotations that are provided. And from what I've noticed, I didn't see that. I could be looking in the wrong location, but then, so I was wondering if there's any way to get that information from that exception, if you guys uh, know of a way. Yeah, really great question. Uh, Dimitri, I know with filters and surrogate for either of you, would you like to dive in? Um, yeah, question two. Are you sure that an exception was thrown instead of like 200 was returned and that and the reason why the call was filtered uh, was provided via the metadata uh, so i did check it was uh, blocked and it did provide a exception and everything mm -hmm. and so, it wasn't a 200 okay. return and and saying exception you mean the like a c sharp exception was thrown right in this case yep. Okay, then it should be a bug because uh, at the time we have, where, when we were working on the, on the exception handling functionality, semantic kernel, uh, we've 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 made sure that all all the all the internal exceptions are preserved. So, for example, if Open API or Azure Open API SDK we are using throwing an exception, we uh, we used to include that as an inner exception for the semantic kernel exception. So, if you could point us to the well, if you can provide a scenario, uh, yeah, we will look into this and see whether this inner exception is lost okay. because it's, we, we should have it. And I then have another question. So I was then testing uh, not blocking inputs, but uh, blocking outputs. And with those, when it's providing uh, the finish reason of like content filtering, when uh, going through and looking at the internals, you guys uh, do have the annotations inside of there stored, but it's not in a very like easily accessible way. It's inside of a bunch of kind of private and internal fields. And so the only way I've been able to access that is using a bunch of reflection. And I was wondering if you guys are intending to one day add that in it to the metadata so that I can just be easily grabbed. Um, Roger, um, does it sound yeah. familiar to you? Yeah, I can I can jump to that. So uh, pretty much we have the breaking glass scenario for every response. So instead of using reflection, you can access the underlying SDK. So for both of the streaming APIs and non-stream APIs, you can access the inner content of a content and cast that to the specific type and you get access to all the details on what was given there by the underlying SDK. We have many examples in the concepts uh, using that for even getting the usage that you can get in the metadata, but you can also get through the inner content. And yeah, I, I can point uh, offline uh, any of those uh, com um, contents for you. That makes sense. Yeah, if you could uh, send me a link to that, I can take a look. Perfect. Thanks so much for the questions, Roger or uh, uh, Robert and Roger for answering. Thanks so much to, uh, for diving in. Other questions that folks may have.
I'll keep watching chat um, while we're waiting for folks. If there are any other questions, is there anything that folks have been working on the last couple of weeks or things that they've been testing out that you would be comfortable sharing with the group? Would love to learn what you're doing with Semantic Kernel too, if folks are uh, comfortable doing that. I'm going to give it a minute or two more if anyone's typing or any questions, but looks like we have nothing else from this week's office hours. I want to thank everyone for joining, everyone from the Semantic Kernel team for joining and for diving into some of our updates as well. And so with that, we'll go ahead and end our recording, but we'll stay on in case anyone is still typing. Thanks, everyone.